one of the things that I like to do, and if you've been here any length of time at all, you, you know that we do this, and this series isn't going to be any different, is that any time we talk about family or marriage, I like to do a little exercise. So what I want to do for every couple that's here, if your spouse is there next to you, and this is such a fun thing because I found out in first service that one of our spouses was texting his wife. She wasn't here, but he was texting her this whole exercise. So how do you need to do this, right? So if you're sitting here this morning, husbands and wife, husbands, we lead the way. We're responsible. We set, the, we set the atmosphere in our home. We set the thermostat, right? So I want you to look at your wife. I don't want you to say something to her very sincerely. I want you to say, I love you. I'm sorry. Said that wasn't so hard. Please forgive me. Now, that's kind of funny, but that's kind of healing as well. Ladies, I want you to look at your husband. And I want you to say these words. I want you to say, I love you. I forgive you. And I'm sorry. Father, I thank you this morning that we just start by cleaning the slate. Father, just starting fresh, just laying aside those things that could be distractions if we let them this morning. Because we know that our marriages and our homes are under attack, that there is a supernatural aspect. God, not just, not just schedules, not just busyness, not just the hassles of life, but God, there is a spiritual attack, demonic even in nature, comes against our homes. And Father, we purpose today to push back against everything that the enemy is pushing on us and towards us. And today we resist it. And Father, we thank you that we are going to have a marriage that honors you and that is strengthened in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's get started this morning. I want to begin by making a statement. In fact, I want to just show it to you. And it says there is a huge difference between a marriage and a family. And because what happens oftentimes is we put them together and say the marriage and the family is the same thing. They are not the same thing, not by any stretch of the imagination. And so the most important part, since they are different, the most important part is the marriage and not the family. Now, the family is important, but you got to put the marriage first in order for the family to work. And many times we've got that twisted around and we've got it in the wrong order, and that's why there are problems in our marriage. So the marriage is the most important part of the family, not the kids. Some of you need to demote your kids. How many know that when you drive your car, they tell you to put your kids in the back seat because it's safer and better for them? Same is true in your marriage. Put them in the back seat, not the, not the front seat, certainly not the driver's seat. And begin to work on your marriage so that your family can be better. So it's not the kids that's the most important. It's not the house. It's not the stuff in the house, but the marriage itself. So the first message in this series that I'm bringing this morning, my goal is to help us, so to speak, secure our marriages or protect the marriage. Because if the marriage isn't working, trust me, all this other stuff isn't going to work either. So we want to ensure our marriages because that's the wise thing to do. How many of you want to be wise, right? Here's a great verse on wisdom. The book of Proverbs chapter six, chapter 4, verse 6 says, Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it cost all you have, it's worth every penny. Get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. Now, notice something about this verse. That First of all, every time it mentions wisdom, it mentions it in the feminine part. That's not by accident. That's very much on purpose. In fact, if we really want to get everything out of this that we need to today, you could do this without violating Scripture, I believe. Do not forsake, and you could just go ahead and insert your wife's name right there. <laughs> Amen. 
I, I either started revival or fight. I don't know which one, but something's going on, man. <laughs> we ain't sitting on the fence no more. <laughs> Decisions are being made. Do not forsake Carol. She will protect you. Love Carol. She will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Though it costs all you have, and she will. <laughs> Amen, I'm telling you. Though it costs all you have, just sign that check over, baby. You know how it goes. Get understanding. Cherish her. She will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. I've often said talking, and I say this sincerely, that the top two ways that God speaks to me, one is by the Holy Spirit, and the other is by my wife. Those two entities, those two people, those two have my ears and have influence, and I go to them and I look to them for wisdom. So when it says wisdom, understand this. It, you could just say that is your wife in your marriage relationship. Second thing about this, though, is that if you get wisdom just in the natural, God wisdom, heavenly wisdom, it will protect your home. H how many homeowners do we have in the house? Okay, how many you and the bank own the home? All right, we're all, we're all working towards the same thing. We're getting through this thing, right? But when you buy a home, you buy insurance to protect your home because that's what wise people do. You don't want bad things to happen. You, you pray that they don't happen. You guard yourself against them so that it won't happen. But how many know sometimes storms come, tornadoes come, floods come, all of these things come, and we want to protect our home, but the same is true of our marriage. We don't, we don't expect all these things to come, but we know that attacks are going to come against our marriage, so we want to be wise, and we want to have wisdom in that. So I want to take a moment, and I want to share some things with you that are going to show you how to ensure your marriage or how to guard your marriage and protect it when storms come or life gets hard because we know that it does. And the first thing that I would say, and I'm preaching to the choir this morning, is stay in church. I really believe it. The family that prays together stays together. The family that worships together, listen, those marriages are going to be strong and God is going to be able to speak to you and through you. I believe, I, believe, I believe in church. I believe church helps. I believe church heals. And I believe that when we show up at church, God is able to grab our hearts, sort out all of the, all of the confusion, and speak directly to us so that healing can begin. How many of you know that you can hear the Holy Spirit at church? When you come to church, some of you have a God moment. Some of you may already have had a God moment. In fact, that little exercise we did at the, at the beginning may be the best thing that happens to you today or certainly one of the best things that happens to your marriage. Church is a place of healing. In fact, in our corporate prayer times and in our staff times, we've been talking a lot about this, that we want this place to be a place of healing. We want Cornerstone Church to be a place of healing that when people come through the doors, they get better. I don't care if it's physically. I still believe in miracles. I don't, believe it's a he I don't care if it's a healing that God begins to make you stronger each day. If it's physical, mental, emotional, and, and you begin to get your head together and your act together, thank God for that. That's the purpose of the church. We're here to make lives better. Healing happens in the house. Repentance happens at church. That's always good for a marriage. And also, church is a place of new beginnings. And so every one of these things are essential in a marriage. What happens in church is essential in a marriage relationship as well. So thank you for bringing your family to church. Thank you for watching online with your family. But man, you got to keep your family in church. Second thing that I would say is forgive quickly. Sometimes we like to hold on to some things until we see how it's going to work out and see if they're straightening up a little bit before we offer forgiveness. Listen, there are two realities in every marriage. Here's number one. 
you married an imperfect person. And you need to own that because you did it all by yourself. Okay? You married an imperfect person, and you need to own that and understand that. Second thing is, your spouse married an imperfect person. If you're trying to figure that out, that's you. Okay? (laughs) The person you're married to married an imperfect person as well. And the reason I say that is, you cannot expect to have a perfect marriage when you take two imperfect people and throw them together. You're going to have a marriage that is destined to have some rough edges and things that you're going to have to work through in order to get through it and to figure it out. So here's another question. I know I'm asking a lot of questions. I'm making you think this morning, but that's okay. Here's the question. What is the worst sin in a marriage relationship? Now, there may be a lot of things going through your mind right now. You may be pulling up a list. But chances are you're wrong because the worst thing in a marriage relationship is this, unforgiveness. Because what it does is it holds everything else hostage in that marriage. And it's never going to get better no matter what has happened. Everything can be forgiven. But as long as you harbor unforgiveness in a marriage relationship, you're going to kill and destroy that marriage. Unforgiveness will kill your marriage. You'll have to agree. I'm just putting it out there. The third thing that I would say in order to ensure your marriage is you need to stay committed to your marriage relationship. Listen to this statement. I think it's such a powerful statement. I'm going to tell you I'm going to say it twice because I want you to really think about this. Most people judge the health of their marriage, how healthy their marriage is. Most people judge the health of their marriage by how they feel and not by the level of their commitment. Most people judge the health of their marriage by the way they feel and not by the level of their commitment. That is a powerful statement. How many of you know marriage is commitment? If you don't, you're going to find out real quick. Marriage is commitment. Listen, that's not romantic. That's not sexy. That's not convenient. It's none of those things. Commitment is work every day. All right. We we already established most of us here have a mortgage on our house, 15, 30 years, whatever it is. Nothing sexy about a mortgage, really. And, And yet you know that commitment's out there. And there are days that you don't feel like going to work, but you throw the covers back and you get up out of bed and you go to work anyway because you made a commitment and you want to keep a roof over your head. And so you have to have a work ethic and you show up every day to do what you have to do. You have to do the same thing at marriage. You can't phone it in. You can't take a day off. You got to show up every day in your marriage relationship and you got to go to work every day on your marriage. It's awful quiet in this full gospel Presbyterian church today. You got to go to work every day in your marriage relationship. All right, you guys look like you could use a break. Have fun. (laughs) Amen. I know we've been serious, but listen, you got to have some fun because marriage is serious. You got to have some fun in your marriage relationship. Now, I know that I have said in the past, and I'm not backing away from this. I'm going to try to show you the other side of the coin. I know that I've said in the past that marriage is not all about making you happy. That's not the goal of marriage. That's not the end game. God's view of marriage is not to make you happy, but to make you holy. And marriage is an incredible tool to do that. I'll tell you one thing. If you're married, you will pray. Amen. And your prayer life will increase. And so marriage is this great discipleship journey that if you will let it, God will show you how to how to draw closer to him in that relationship. It will make you more Christ-like. Marriage will cause you to be more in tune with the Spirit. Marriage will make you work harder on the fruit of the Spirit in your life. 
and it's going to show you how to put someone else in front of yourself, and marriage will show you how to be a servant. And Christianity is all about serving others. So all of those things happen in a marriage relationship. I understand that. But even though marriage isn't necessarily designed to make you just happy, it really was never designed to make you miserable either. So you don't have to live at one end of the spectrum. you got to find a balance in this thing. You can be happy and be a servant as well. See, here's what marriage does. It provides companionship. This is my best friend sitting right here. I like to say that because sometimes you, you, you can leave your spouse, but it's hard to leave your best friend. You better work on the friendship in your marriage relationship. Marriage is fellowship. We like just hanging together. Marriage is security. Marriage is friendship. And marriage is fun. We ought to have some fun in our marriage relationships. In fact, find something that you like to do together. It can be anything. My wife and I, we love riding bikes together. We, we do a lot of biking together. We love that. We, we like hiking together. I, I'm learning how to cook. I want to learn how to cook, so she's showing me how to cook. Although I think there's something going on behind the scenes there that she's really working that angle a little bit. I need to think that through. <laughs> but we're doing some things together that's always important. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 9 says, live joyfully with the life, with the wife who you love all the days of your life. And if I could just paraphrase that into a soundbite or into a tweet, I would say it this way, enjoy your life with your wife. Amen. Enjoy your life with your wife. Have fun together. And let me help you out with something you can do. Amen. Have sex. <laughs> Let's talk about sex for just a moment. Who didn't see that coming, right? While you're thinking about that, and this is a good time, that if you have a heart condition, go ahead and take your heart pill. Or if you have small children, usher them out of the room, it'll be all right. Let me tell you a joke while, we're, while you're getting everything in order here. God created Adam and Eve, created Adam first, and he created Eve. And he said, Adam, come here, I want you to do something. Adam, I want you to go, and I want you to give Eve a hug. And Adam said, God, what's a hug? And so God explained to him what it was. Adam goes off, comes back a minute later. God says, good job. He says, now, Adam, I want you to go and give Eve a kiss. Adam says, God, what's a kiss? God explained to him what it was. Adam goes off, comes back a minute later. God says, good job. He says, now, Adam, I want you to go have sex with Eve. Adam says, God, what's sex? God explains to him. This time, Adam jogs off. Turns around, comes back a few minutes later, and says, God, what's a headache? <laughs> now, I don't know if that's true or not. I didn't really read that. I just thought that might give you a moment to catch your breath as we talk about sex here. But I tell you the part that is true is that God created Adam first, and there's a great principle here. God created Adam before he brought Eve. He wanted to make sure Adam already had a job, had a place to live, had a relationship with God. And just in case you're connecting the thoughts, if you're thinking about getting married, those are good things to make to look for in a spouse. Amen. And then he brought Eve to Adam. Now, when he brought Eve to Adam, she was a perfect ten. She was flawless, and she was naked. And Adam said, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You guys thought David wrote that. I'm pretty sure it was Adam that said that. But it did say this. It said in Genesis chapter 2 that they were naked and not ashamed. The reason I say that is because sex isn't dirty. See, what we've done is we've taken these two three-letter words, God, G-O-D, and sex, S-E-X, and what we've done is we said, okay, sex has to go way over here because God's way over here. And when I want to get close to God, i got to get away. I, we can't bring the two together. Are you kidding me? God thought of sex, and it wasn't just for procreation. It was for fun. It was for pleasure. You don't believe me? Get your Bibles and go, when you get home today, read the Song of Solomon, chapter 4 and chapter 7, and you can blush in private. But God, God created this incredible gift of sex, and he wants husbands and wives to be united together through that. Sex isn't dirty. Sex is the thing, is the glue that holds a marriage together. Let me read a scripture to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and it says, The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, his sexual obligation to his wife. 
and likewise the wife also to her husband. So what it's saying here is that you owe good sex to each other. That's part of the deal when you got married. Well, I, I, I didn't know he was going to watch sex all the time. You should have read the small print. <laughs> Check it out. It's on the license. <laughs> it's on mine anyway. I wrote it in. <laughs> That's just me. You feel free to work. You do you. I'll do me. It says, it says the wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. So what it's saying here is that you don't withhold sex and you don't use sex as a weapon. You don't punish with sex. You don't manipulate with sex. You don't pout with sex. You don't do all of this, okay? Let's get our marriages right. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent for a time so that you may, may devote yourselves to prayer. Now, those of you, if you've gone more, we just had our 21 days of prayer and fasting. If you've gone more than 21 days without sex, get back at it. That's what it's saying here. Listen, you, you, can, you can break away for times of spiritual seasons of seeking God and getting close. But when that's over, come on back together. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, let me share with you something that I, I shared with the staff a, a few months back in staff meeting. We're just, I'm just trying to give them, you know, just things that I've learned along the way. I haven't learned a lot, but I've learned a few things. And, and one of the things that I said, guys, listen, if you want to stay in ministry, then one of the things that you have to do, you have to do is you have to fall in love with your spouse publicly. You have to make sure that everybody around you knows that's your good thing. She's your wife, and you, don't have, you have eyes for no one else. That means in public, you need to say how much you love her, how much you appreciate her. You, you, need to, you need to hug her, smack her on the bottom, whatever you do. You do you, I'll do me. All right? You need to let people know this is my wife, and I love her. This is my husband, and I love him. That way, there'll never be an opportunity for anyone to say, hey, maybe there's a chance. So one, that's very good advice. If you want to stay in ministry, you better fall in love with your spouse publicly. Second thing that I said, wives, listen to me very carefully here. Don't ever make fun of your husband's need for sex. Don't belittle him. Don't make jokes. He's like a light switch. He's always on. I can't keep him off of me, whatever. Listen, God designed men with a sex drive and an ego. Just the way God made them. We'll get into that later in the series. So those are things. He's saying here that we owe each other. In fact, the word do benevolence, which the word, the, those two words, that phrase in the King James literally, literally means this, that you owe good sex. It means to pay what you owe. It means it's due and that you owe good sex to each other. Not average, not mechanical. Don't just say, let's get this over with. But to mutually satisfy not just to have sex, but to mutually satisfy each other. See, a Christian man or woman deprived of sex becomes a target for Satan to tempt. So, let me say it again. Sex is the glue that holds a marriage together. Now, sex isn't love, right? Sex isn't love, but it keeps two people who do love each other together. It keeps them connected. So here's a great question. What then, oops, what is the purpose of marriage? What's, what's the purpose of marriage? Very simple. It's for two people to become one flesh. That is both a mystery. I don't fully understand it, but I know that it is the goal of marriage to not just be what I want when I want it, but that we become one flesh, that we're operating together, separate, and yet together in one flesh. That is both a, a mystery and a miracle, and we are working to produce that miracle in our life. Here's a great scripture in Genesis chapter 2. It said, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So I will make a helper suitable for him. I'm going to create someone that can be there with him. Now, ladies, don't let this word helper paint a wrong picture in your mind. 
it, it doesn't mean an assistant to do the paperwork. It doesn't mean someone that is less than him, all right? In fact, the best way I know to illustrate this is this. One of the words for the Holy Spirit is helper. And yet the Holy Spirit is God. And the Holy Spirit helps me. Why? Because I need help. I'm better with him. And I'll tell you right now, and everybody that knows me at all knows, I'm better with her, my wife, than without her. And so she is my helper because she helps me in so many things that I do. So it's not a matter of who's important, who's, in, who's, who's number one, who's number two. It's us working together. But it says, I will make him a helper that is suitable for him. The greatest thing I could give you in a marriage conference or a marriage series like this is how we treat one another. And that is with love and respect. And if you can work those two things in your marriage relationship, you can begin to build a solid marriage. Love and respect. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, husbands, love your wives. That means there's someone in my life that I need to put in front of myself. Marriage isn't about making me happy. My goal in marriage is to make her happy. I want to give to her. She's my mission field. She's my, uh, she's my ministry. And so my, my job is to make her the best that I possibly can. I want to add to her, not take away from her. So when it says, husbands, love your wives, love is, love is a verb. It's not just that emotion. Oh, I feel I get warm fuzzies around her. That's good. But if I love her, guess what? I'm going to do actions to show her what love looks like. But then it says, wives, respect your husbands. I thought this was so interesting when I found this out. And I'm always finding out things about the Bible. It doesn't say for wives to love your husbands. It says husbands love your wives, but it doesn't say for the wife to love the husband. It says wife respect your husband. And let me tell you why that happens, because the way men are wired, when our wives respect us, we feel loved. When my wife says, baby, you're the greatest, you're so smart, that was a great decision, thank you, I interpret that as she loves me. That means more to me than for her to say, I love you. I like that, don't get me wrong. But when she, when she respects me, then I feel loved. So it's this love and respect thing. Let me, let me read to you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great love chapter of the Bible. And I'm going to read it from the, from the Message Bible because it really, really makes it, brings it up to date for today. And it says, first of all, love never gives up. Love cares, for more, love cares more for others than self. Love doesn't, doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Love doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always me first doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything. That explains a lot. Trust God always. Always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. God, give me a spouse like that. Amen. I can get along with that person. Love never dies. So that's what love looks like. Now, I'm going to challenge your thinking here. I'm going to challenge your thinking and your actions here. I want to ask you a question. Do you love your spouse? Because here's what happens. I know we all say, yeah, of course I, I love my spouse, but there's a disconnect. There's a gap. Because when you ask the question, do you love your spouse, we all say, well, yeah. Yeah. And see, we, we, we see it up here. Well, yeah, sure, I love her. But when you really begin to break it down and, and look at the facts, sometimes this is where I think I am, but this is where I really am. There's a disconnect. There's a gap here. So how, how do I fill in the gap? And I, I want to try to do that. I don't know if I'll be successful, but, but I want to try to do that. When you say, I, I realize I've got some problems, I really want to be more patient with my wife. That sounds like love. 
That's my goal. I want to be more patient. I've set a goal this year. You know, if you say that, I've, I've set a goal this year. I want to be more patient with my wife. I want to be more patient with my husband. That's love. That ain't love. Let me show you the disconnect. Let me show you how far off that is. Love says, I enjoy being patient with my spouse. It's my joy. Love says, I enjoy being kind. I'm not trying. I enjoy it. I, I love. I love it. It's something that, that gears me up. So I'm not praying to get better. Love says, I enjoy being patient. I enjoy being kind. I enjoy being thoughtful. I enjoy being tender. I enjoy all of those things because that's when I begin to narrow the gap and bring it closer together. Look at this scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And it says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. And there's a lot of ways to look at that verse, but I want to look at it in a marriage relationship this morning. As hard as my wife and I work on our marriage relationship, it will never be good until it's God good. In other words, we, we can do some things, but when we bring that third string, that third strand, God, into our marriage, he supernaturally multiplies everything in our marriage and strengthens that marriage relationship. And if it's not being built on God or with God, listen, it's going to be a struggle all of your married life. When you begin to invite God, that third string, in, you know, we do a lot of marriage ceremonies, and, and, you know, there's so many people have these creative ideas for marriage, mixing the sand and candles, and, and there's one where they, I've done a marriage where they even braid the cords together, symbolically saying, this is me, and this is you, but this third strand is God. That's what we want in our marriage. That's what we're looking for. Would you stand with me this morning? That's what God wants to do, is to strengthen your marriage. So what I want to do this morning, that means a couple of ways. And first of all, it begins with you. And I don't know who's here this morning, but I, I, I just know this morning that if you want your marriage to get better, the closer you get to God, the better you get, which makes your, better, your marriage better automatically. And maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God. That's not a condemning thing. That's just, that's just where you're at. But the moment you give your life to God, trust me, he enlarges your ability to love. In fact, God says if you don't know God, you don't know what love is. You're limited in love. The greatest thing you could do for yourself and for your marriage this morning is to start a relationship with God. And maybe you're here as a believer, as a Christian, and you know God, but you're not right where you need to be. The greatest you could do, greatest thing you could do for God today is to renew your walk with God and draw close to God, and it would bring healing in your marriage. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for just a moment. I'm not going to ask you to step forward or come out, but I am going to ask you to raise your hand. If you're here this morning and you say, I need to give my life to Christ, I need to experience God's love, or maybe this morning I need to rededicate my life to God. Would you raise your hand this morning and I'll pray for you. Anybody this morning, raise your hand and just say, Pastor, when you pray, pray for me to begin a relationship with God or I want to rededicate my life to God this morning. Anyone? Then the second way that we invite God into our marriage or, or, or that, that we make that three-stranded cord is when we say, God, I want to do marriage your way. Not the way my parents did it. Not the way I see it portrayed, social media or any other way. But God, I want to do marriage your way. It's your idea, your gift, your way. And I want to invite you into my life this morning. And I want to invite you into my marriage. And here's what I'm going to do. We didn't do this first service, but we're going to do it this service. Is that if that's you this morning... 
I want to ask you to do something. Are you willing to come forward this morning? Father, we take a moment right now and we invite you to a deeper level, in a deeper way, into our relationship together. God, we look for your leading. We look for your strength. And God, what we have and what we've experienced, we're grateful for. But we know in reality, we've only scratched the surface of what you can do. So we invite your love. We invite the Holy Spirit. We, we realize that this marriage that you've given us is a sacred thing. And that it matters. And God, that you'll even use our marriage to strengthen other marriages. That you'll even use our marriage to let people see God in us. And God, that's our prayer. That's part of our prayer today. Father, we take this moment, that third chord in our life is your word. That third chord in your life is the Holy Spirit. That third chord in our life, in our marriage, is our relationship with Christ. And so, Jesus, we invite you not just into parts of our marriage, not just into certain rooms or certain areas, but we invite you into our marriage today. Let me hear your word. Father, give me the courage by the Holy Spirit to follow what I know to do. Father, let me be unashamed to love openly that, that God, you so loved us, you gave, you gave. Father, cause, cause us to be givers in our marriage. Cause us to prefer the other above ourselves. Father, help us to be servants in our marriage relationship. God, we purpose to serve you. And Father, but we do that by serving this person next to us. And as we serve them, I believe with all of my heart, God, we are serving you. And we're making a difference and we're making an impact in your life, in our life. Father, we thank you for the grace. We thank you for the goodness. God, even through the storms, even through the battles, God, even through the difficult times, we're going to keep our marriage in church. We're going to keep our marriage based around the Word of God. Father, we're going to pull together and not apart. And today we make that commitment. Today we say to each other, come on, I want us to do this. I want you to look at your spouse. Come on, we're going to do it one more time. Even if you're not down there, look at your spouse. I want you to say this. It's real easy. It's real easy. Look at your spouse. I want you to say, I still do. I still do. Come on. Come on. Amen. Amen. Come on. Not that I do, I still do. Amen. 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 Guys, we love you this morning. Thank you for that step of faith. God's going to honor that. You can be seated this morning. We're going to give it back to those in the, in the lobby. They're going to kind of walk us out of here today.